Okay, welcome back to module one. What is this thing called weather? We are on moisture and clouds. So just a little review of the hydrologic cycle. This is the movement of water through the atmosphere. So the hydrologic cycle is the continuous exchange of water among the oceans, the atmosphere, and the continents. So checking out the diagram on the right, we see the hydrologic cycle. If we start with precipitation, it falls to the earth. Some is infiltrated into the soil. Most is runoff out into the oceans, which then becomes evaporation, which becomes clouds, and then precipitation occurs again. Don't forget evapotranspiration from our plants as well. Water is a unique substance on the planet Earth because it's the only um, substance that has a large amount of liquid on the surface of the planet. It exists in all forms on Earth, and ice, the solid state, is less dense than liquid. You see this when you have a glass of iced tea or soda, and the ice floats towards the top. Thank goodness, right? Because if it didn't do that, <laughs> then... Lakes, for example, would freeze from the bottom, and we wouldn't have any fish in the springtime. That would be bad. Water also has a high heat capacity, meaning it takes a while to change these different phases. And it has the unique ability to form hydrogen bonds. Remember that water is H2O, meaning two hydrogens, one oxygen, and those hydrogen bonds form between the oxygen and the hydrogen. So this crystalline pattern should look familiar because that's what ice looks like under the microscope. So the more hydrogen bonds, the lower the state of energy. So this is ice. A more excited state would be here. This is liquid water. So I still see some hydrogen bonds, but not as many. And then gas would have um, none at all or very, very few. When I change states, there's something called latent heat that's being released or absorbed. This energy is absorbed with no increase in temperature. This is very important when it comes to building our hurricanes, which you'll be learning later. So the latent heat of melting is melting one gram of ice, which requires 80 calories from the environment. Or the latent heat of fusion is freezing one gram of water, which releases 80 calories. So when I release it, it then lowers its energy state so it freezes and becomes ice um another example of two opposites would be evaporation and condensation so evaporation is liquid to water vapor this includes the latent heat of vaporization which is evaporating one gram of water which requires 600 calories from the environment so as it cools it from the environment the environment cools which is why evaporation is a cooling process as opposed to condensation, which then releases that 600 calories, because you're like, wait, where's those 600 calories going? Well, it's then released back into the environment when there's condensation, which is how, again, hurricanes form and get their energy. So this is latent heat of condensation. And that's from water vapor to liquid, just to be clear. Now, there are two other changes of phases. One is solid to gas, that's called sublimation and there's about 680 calories being released in that process. A good example of that is if you have an ice cube tray, an old school ice cube tray in your, in your fridge, freezer, and if it sits there for a really long time, you might notice that the ice starts to like disappear. It's not melting, it's sublimating. So it's becoming water vapor or gas inside your freezer. So when you open the freezer, you get that kind of cloud that pulls out that's where that comes from. And then the opposite is also true. We have gas to solid. That is called deposition. A good example of that would be the mini fridge from your college days. <laughs> so when you have the little mini fridge, um, there forms that little crust on the outside sometimes. That is deposition. So it's gas straight to solid. And that's why you have to defrost the mini fridge. Ta-da! Okay, so we're going to be talking about parcels from now on. Parcels are just a one meter cube imaginary bubble of air, and it includes nitrogen, which is the little green peas here. Nitrogen is N2, so there's two nitrogens 
um, in the molecule. And then there's oxygen, which is the red guys. And these are water vapor, which I like to call Mickey Mouse is not a sponsor. I don't, it doesn't really look like Mickey Mouse, but maybe if it helps you remember. So H, right, two H's, one O. So humidity, when I talk about humidity, is just the amount of water vapor in the air, which is if I count up these little water vapors right here. Okay, so that's all that humidity is. But there are more technical ways to express it. So let me move myself over here. Okay, so absolute humidity is the mass of water vapor in a given volume of air, and then mixing ratio <clears throat> is the mass of water vapor in a unit of air compared to the mass of dry air. So let's do an example. If I have this parcel, which is one meter cubed, just like I told you a second ago, and the mass is one kilogram, then it gives me the mass of water vapor as 20 grams. So absolute humidity, mass of water vapor, which they said was 20 grams, divided by volume of air, which is one meter cubed. So I have 20 grams per meter cubed. Okay, that's what we start with. Now, what's the mixing ratio? That would be the mass of water vapor, which is 20 grams, divided by the mass of dry air, which is one kilogram. You might be like, whoa, whoa. time out, professor. I see a problem here because I could just multiply the top by a thousand, I would get kilograms and then they would cancel out, right? Your units cancel out. It would be a unitless number. And yes, that's totally true. So we in meteorology express it as grams per kilogram. So don't worry about it. Yes, it's a unitless number. It's okay. I'm telling you it's okay. <laughs> Some people get upset by that. Okay, let's move to the second example. So now I'm going to double the size of my parcel. So now it's two meter cube. The mass is the same, water vapor is the same. Let's see what happens to our two expressions of humidity. So the absolute humidity is the mass of water vapor, which I said hadn't changed, 20 grams, divided by the volume of air, which is two meter cubed. Oh, so I have 20 divided by two, which is 10, right? So 10 grams per meter cubed. So that dropped by half by doubling the size of the parcel. So what happens to my mixing ratio? Let's check it out. So mixing ratio is the mass of water vapor, which is still 20 grams, divided by the mass of dry air, which is still one kilogram. So this one doesn't change. So why is that again? Mixing ratio doesn't change because it's not dependent on the volume of air. It's only mass of water vapor to mass of dry air. Okay? Now, next we will cover vapor pressure and saturation. So vapor pressure is like if I take the pressure, the total pressure of atmosphere is equal to the pressure of nitrogen plus the pressure of oxygen plus the pressure of argon plus, 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 and then finally plus water vapor. So the pressure of water vapor. So I'm saying I'm taking the pressure of water vapor and I'm taking it out. And that is what I'm presenting to you, is just that little portion right there. So that is what vapor pressure is. Now, saturation is the maximum possible quantity of water vapor that the air can hold at some given temperature and pressure. Very important, we have temperature and pressure. So if I increase the temperature, I can increase the amount of water vapor that I'm holding. And humid air is going to have a high vapor pressure. Okay, so I'm going to prove it. So over here we have an example. We have an aquarium kind of tank full of dry air at the top and then water at the bottom. It's 20 degrees C and my pressure gauge is at roughly Newton. There's no numbers, so I'm just gonna make up numbers. So now I leave it for a while and now this becomes moist air because the water vapor molecules are evaporating and condensing and more are evaporating than condensing. So we have moisture in the air. So what happens to my pressure? Oh, it goes up. So now it's roughly two o'clock because why? There is now vapor in the air and that's being measured as that change right so as i continue to let it interact now we have the same number of molecules that are evaporating and condensing because the air is saturated so once the air is saturated it can't hold anymore right this is the most it can hold at 20 degrees c i can hold no more so this is the saturation vapor pressure meaning the highest vapor pressure that i can contain at 20 degrees C. Now, what's the only way that I could hold more water vapor? Hmm. 
perhaps if I add fire, right? So if I heat it, I'm just joking. So I'm, I add a Bunsen burner. I'm heating my tank now to 30 degrees C. So I said over here, spoilers, if I increase the temperature, I can increase the vapor pressure, right? And saturation. So now it interacts even more. So now it's saturated. And now the saturation vapor pressure with 30 degrees C is over at like seven o'clock compared to four o'clock for the 20 degrees C. So again, as the temperature increases, it can hold more water vapor. Okay, so this graph is kind of a way to prove that the saturation vapor pressure, this is the vapor pressure at a given temperature, where it's in equilibrium with the surface of pure water, which you just saw in the example, or ice. You can also do it with ice. Notice it goes below zero <laughs> degrees C. So in that last example, we started at 20 degrees, which is roughly 14 grams per kilogram. So that's how much it could possibly hold. And then when we heated it to 30 degrees C, what happened? Let's see. It goes up to like 26 or so, like 26 grams per kilogram. So it almost doubles, I'm exaggerating, but it almost doubles how much it can hold in the air, right? Just by heating it to 30 degrees C from 20 degrees C. Okay, so the next way that we express humidity is called relative humidity. You've probably heard this on the news more than once. So this is just a ratio of the actual water vapor content to the amount that we could hold per saturation. So if I hold the maximum I can, and this is the maximum it can, then I get one times 100%, you get 100% relative humidity. So in the little example I have here, I have a 50 degrees Fahrenheit, this is like 7 a.m. This is the water vapor present. The yellow is how much it can hold. Notice that the yellow is completely covered by the water vapor here. So I have the total amount um, divided by the saturation, which is equal to that number. So in this case, I get 100% relative humidity. As I move to like 11 a.m., I see it's 68 degrees Fahrenheit. The amount of water vapor has not changed. I'm holding it constant. So the bucket size of the temperature has grown bigger. So I can hold more water vapor, but there isn't more water vapor, right? So I would get 0.52 times 100%. I get 52% relative humidity. Finally, in the afternoon, it's now 86 degrees Fahrenheit. My bucket size, or how much I can hold, is really big now, but I held the water vapor constant. There is no more. So now it's 0.28 times 100%, or 28% relative humidity. So I have more examples of relative humidity. So 100% equals saturation. Right? So that's the maximum it can possibly hold. Now, there are a couple ways to change it. First is we add more water vapor, or we can change the temperature. So let's do adding more water vapor first. So if I add more water vapor, the relative humidity goes up, spoilers. And then if it's removed, it goes down. So let's look at our example. So temperature is going to be held constant right here at 25 degrees C. You see it's the same in all three panels. I have one kilogram of air. I have five grams of water vapor. And the saturation mixing ratio at 25 degrees C is 20 grams. Where do we get that? Well, we go back to this graph. 25, read up the line. Yep, that's about what we got, right? 20 grams. Okay. So it says it has 5 divided by the total it could possibly hold, which is 20. 5 divided by 20 is 0.25 times 100%. So I get 25% relative humidity to start with. That is my initial conditions. Now, oh, don't forget this puddle. Okay, so it has a puddle at the bottom. The puddle is now interacting with the air. More evaporation has occurred, so I have 10 grams of water vapor now. Temperature is the same. Saturation mixing ratio has not changed, right? So now I have 10 grams divided by 20. That's the total it can hold at 25 degrees C. So I have 0.25 times 100% which is 50% relative humidity. Then in the final panel, it's now evaporated to the point where it's completely, that's it, that's as much as it can hold. Well, let's double check. So we said the saturation mixing ratio is 20 grams at 25 degrees C. That's saturation. 
It now has 20 grams. So 20 divided by 20 is 1 times 100%. You have 100% relative humidity. Ta-da! So that was just changing the amount of water vapor in the air. Now we're going to do the other one where we decrease the temperature to increase our relative humidity. So I start with 20 degrees C, 1 kilogram of air, and I have 7 grams of water vapor. What is the saturation mixing ratio for 20 degrees C? We remember from the very first example is 14 grams. So the water vapor content is 7 grams, so we just said that, divided by 14, which is the saturation, which is 0 .2, 0 0.5 times 100%, I get 50% relative humidity as my initial conditions. Now I take the flask, the Erlenmeyer flask, I chuck it in the fridge, and it cools to 10 degrees C. Okay? Water vapor content is the same, right? Nothing's changed there, just the temperature. Okay, so I've chucked it in the fridge. Now I have to read back on that line. We're going to trust that they did it the right way. So it says that it's 7 grams. Okay, I have 7 grams. 7 divided by 7 is 1. So 1 times 100%, I get 100% relative humidity. Ta-da! So what happens if I keep cooling it? Let's find out. So I chuck it back in the fridge, maybe the freezer, because it's zero degrees C, right? And now it says the saturation mixing ratio at zero degrees C is 3.5 grams. Wait, what? That's, how's that possible, right? Well, what's happened? Oh, there's liquid here, right? So what happened? I literally condensed out of the air the water. So now I have a puddle at the bottom that's 3.5 grams, and I have the air holding 3.5 grams because the air couldn't hold anymore because it got so cold so it condensed out. This is what happens when we have dew form right during the springtime or fall. So that's dew forming right there. There's our dew. So we have 3.5 divided by 3.5 still gives us 1 so we still have 100% relative humidity. So again the first example I add or subtract more water vapor that changes my relative humidity. The other way is to change my temperature. So, during the day, how does temperature change? How does relative humidity change? Let's look at that. So, generally speaking, the lowest temperature is in the morning time, just before sunrise, and then the highest temperatures will be afternoon-ish, right? So, the opposite is true for my relative humidity. Relative humidity should be highest right before sunrise, because that's my lowest temperature. So it's going to be my smallest bucket size, which means whatever water vapor pre is present should be filling the most portion of that. And then at the highest temperature, it should be my lowest relative humidity unless there is some kind of advection right, that changes temperature horizontally or convection that changes my temperature vertically. All right, so the last way we express humidity is dew point or dew point temperature. This is the temperature to which air has to be cooled to reach saturation. It is a measure of actual moisture content. And a great example, back to that iced tea glass. So here we see iced tea. And in this case, the ice is transferring energy to the liquid in the glass. And therefore, the ice is actually heating. The liquid is cooling, right? Liquid is touching the side of the glass. So the side of the glass is cooling. And when it cools, it reaches this dew point temperature, and then you get those beads of dew forming on the outside of your glass. So when you get like soda or ice or what have you, you get a sweating cup, right? And that's why. So here we have for September, some average dew points. You see pretty hot over here, or I should say sticky, right? So dew point makes it feel sticky or more human. So everywhere there's like 60 or above is generally speaking gonna feel sticky, but especially 70 plus. And then it would feel dry in these areas because these are lower dew points, so lower amounts of humidity. Okay, reason why this could be important is something called heat stress. So the heat stress index is caused by high temperatures and high humidity, which is like the worst combination. So what happens is your body sweats to feel cooler. So in this case, 
because the humidity is high, your body cannot sweat. So the sweat can't evaporate, which makes you feel hotter. So that's why it feels hotter on those high humidity days. So it recommends that you take breaks and hydrate or just don't go outside. <laughs> um, that's my method. Anyway, so let's say it's a measly, I don't know, 94 degrees. If it's a 94 degrees Fahrenheit, Let's pick something substantial. Let's go with, uh, I don't know, let's go with the 85% relative humidity. So if it's 85% full of its bucket, right, so if it, it can hold this much and I have that much, then it's going to feel like 135 degrees just because of this, right? So it's the relative humidity that makes it feel hotter because you're not able to sweat, you're not able to perspire and cool off. So there are several risks involved with each of these little colors. So we got fatigue, then we have muscle cramps, then we have sunstroke, and then there's heat stroke or sunstroke likely. So especially if you're dehydrated, so definitely take breaks, stay inside if possible, use air conditioning, fans, all that kind of stuff. Okay, so when we're in class, I like to ask what your favorite community range is. I like it slightly more humid when I don't have to put like lotion on my hands. I don't like that. Um, some people like it dry as, dry as a bone. Some people like it really, really humid. So usually most people say they like it in between somewhere. Okay, so now we'll switch gears. We're gonna talk about lifting so we can make some clouds. I'll move myself over here. Okay. First process that lifts our air is orographic lifting. This is not orthographic lifting, <laughs> those are birds. So orographic lifting, this is the process which mountains or highlands act as barriers to the flow of air. Remember you're a meteorologist, so ground is in the way of the air. Yeah, so it forces the air to ascend, the air cools adiabatically, and clouds and precipitation may result. You'll learn more about adiabatically next week. So here we have the example of the Sierra Nevadas. We see the wind coming in off the Pacific Ocean. It lifts over the side of the mountains. And the wind side, the side that's receiving the wind, is called the windward side. This side gets all wet, lots of precipitation. We see the sequoias there. And on the other side, there's a rain shadow, so a lack of rain. And this is on the leeward side, meaning no wind. And it is dry. This is where the Great Basin is. Here's a picture of that. Number two is called frontal lifting. This is also called frontal wedging. It's the lifting of air resulting when cool air acts as a barrier for which the warmer, lighter air has to rise. And fronts are just a boundary between two different air masses. They have different densities. One's usually warmer than the other, or one has a higher moisture content than the other. Again, you'll learn about that in a couple classes. So here we have that example, warm air shoving up over the cold air. Number three is called convergence. This is the condition that exists when wind distribution is into an area, like an inflow, right? And then it smushes into each other and it can't go down into the ground, so it's forced upwards. So we have net inflow of air into an area and then it has to go up. So it favors cloud formation. Great example is Florida. They have two sea breezes, one from the Atlantic Ocean, one from the Gulf of Mexico. They converge over Florida, and so you see all the clouds here over the peninsula. I love this picture. I think it's awesome. All right, so first, sorographic lifting, then we have frontal wedging, and then convergence, and the last one is called localized convective lifting. So these are unequal surface heating that causes localized pockets of air to rise. They are called thermals. So I see a dark area as opposed to these lighter squares, and the darker area receives more solar heating. It then rises into a thermal, and then when it cools and reaches a certain level, it creates a cloud. So this is over time, obviously. And why do I have a bird here? Because birds are lazy, and they don't want to flap their wings all the time. So they will actually ride in these thermals. So you'll see them spinning around in circles, kind of high up in the sky. That's how you can easily spot a thermal. Okay, so speaking of cloud formation, this is how they form. 
So a cloud is just a visible aggregate of small water droplets. It's literally just a whole bunch of water droplets together. It's hard to imagine that the puffy things in the sky are just water droplets, but that's what they are. So we need something called condensation nuclei or tiny particles to act as surfaces for that water vapor to condense onto. There are two different types. One is hygroscopic nuclei. This is water seeking, so it wants the water. Um, great example being salt in your chips. So if you open your chips and you leave it open on a hot, sticky day, you might notice that it goes stale really quickly, right? That's actually humidity sticking to the salt on your chips. Sorry. So they have a high affinity for water. And then the opposite is hydrophobic or water repelling, doesn't want the water, like oil or gasoline, that would be a good example. These are not efficient condensation nuclei. They will only form in them when the relative humidity reaches 100% um, or above. So obviously it's going to go for these guys first, the water seeking, and then the water repelling if nothing else is available. So the growth of cloud droplets is pretty rapid at first. You see here, yes, it's over 100%. So that's okay, <laughs> it happens. So it slows down as the water vapor is consumed. Here's my pure water droplets. Notice the size is increasing. So as the size increases, the growth is slowed down, right? But once we get the cloud, we have like billions and billions of these tiny water droplets, usually having a radii of 20 micrometers or less. So these are very, very tiny. And all the droplets remain suspended by like the slightest breeze or updraft. It's kind of amazing, actually. So how do we classify all these clouds? Well, here comes the Latin portion of your class. Okay, so here we go. First is cirrus or cirriform clouds. These are high, white, and thin. They form delicate veil-like patches like so. You see wisp-like strands, and they often have a feather feathery appearance. Cirrus is Latin for curl or filament. And then number two is our cumulus clouds or cumuliform clouds. These consist of globular cloud masses that are often described as cotton-like. So they're like little cotton balls in the sky. Um, they usually have like a flat face, little rounded top. They can be domes or towers. And in Latin, cumulus means heap or pile. Number three is stratus clouds or stratiform clouds. They consist of sheets or layers that cover most or all of the sky. Strata means layer in Latin. And finally, number four, we have nimbus clouds. These are clouds that are major producer of precipitation. Nimbus cloud means violent rain in Latin, but it can also produce snow, just so you know. Okay, so the first thing that we need for the cloud classification is its form or appearance. That's what we just did. And then we need the cloud height and then we'll mix and match. So the second is cloud height. So high clouds are above 6,000 meters or 20,000 feet. Middle clouds range between 2,000 and 6,000 meters or 6,500 to 20,000 feet. Low clouds are at altitudes of less than 2,000 meters or less than 6,500 feet. And then there's the ones that break all the rules. <laughs> so we have clouds of vertical development and they extend upward to span more than one height range. Um, if you ever lose the cloud chart in the back of your textbook, it's like literally the last page, you can tear it out. But if you tear it out, you can't return the book. Anyway, so you can print your own here, or you can Google one. They can get pretty extensive, so I have another example in a second. Alright, so this is the one in your textbook. So we have high clouds at the top, right? Middle clouds are here, low clouds are here. And then you see your clouds of vertical development breaking the rules on the far right there. There's also, so there's this example. Like I said, they can get pretty extensive. So this one I believe is from Noah, and it's very, very complicated. So you don't need anything this complicated. Um, so careful when you're Googling. This is the cloud table in your textbook if you need characteristics to describe your clouds, or the abbreviation is right here. Alright, so this was originally developed in 1803 by English naturalist Luke Howard based on the form and height of the cloud. So we'll start with our high clouds. 
So cirrus clouds. These are clouds composed of delicate white filaments. The picture's on the next slide. <laughs> cirrus stratus is transparent whitish cloud veils with a fibrous or sometimes smooth appearance that may cover much or all of the sky. These are the ones that create halos, which covered before. And then cirrocumulus are white patches composed of small cells or ripples, small globules, little blobs, little blobs. And sometimes it resembles fish scales. It's also called a macro sky. So here's what they look like. Generally speaking, the pictures on the left will be from the textbook. Pictures on the right will be from yours truly. I know they're not impressive, but I thought you might want to see like real life photos. <laughs> so um, here's Cirrus right here. Then here's a Cirrus stratus. Notice the halo. And here's Cirrocumulus. And you might be wondering, well, how do I know what a high cloud is? Well, you're going to be looking from roughly like 60 or 70 degrees above the horizon to 90 degrees above the horizon. So this one, you definitely have to tilt your head up to look for them. So that's how you know how they're high clouds. Notice the trees are down here. If you have trees as a reference point, you want to look above the trees significantly. So here's some more cirrus. Notice they can rip apart and become cirrostratus. So the winds can definitely rip apart our clouds. Here, I gave you a little trick one here. These are contrails, which can turn into cirrus. They're artificially made clouds by jet engines. Middle clouds. I have alto cumulus. These tend to form in large patches composed of rounded masses or rolls. They may or may not merge together. And then alto stratus, which are a formless layer of grayish clouds that cover all in more, uh, large portions of the sky. Generally speaking, the sun is not going to be discernible as a bright spot. Um, but it, okay, so it can be discernible as a bright spot, but it's not going to create a halo. So that's the difference between the, so you'll see one picture. Okay, so this is also cumulus. Notice the blobs. I see blobs and these clouds, you want to look kind of at tree level up to that point where I showed you before. So like kind of between 45 and 60, that sort of range, like just above the tree line is where these guys live. So also cumulus, this is also strata. So you see the bright spot, but no halo, right? If you see it at all, this is a picture I took. <laughs> so there we see some alto stratus and some alto cumulus. So you can see both at the same time. And then you have this. It's a broken cloud. I should return it to the factory, right? It's actually called a fall streak. I have more about these later, but the one surrounding it is alto stratus. Basically something punches through the cloud and it causes it to collapse and rain or snow out. So that's what happened there. You guys should move me so you can see what happened. There you go. So you can see the snow coming out there. Okay. Low clouds, we have stratus. These are forming in low horizontal layers that on occasion may produce light drizzle, but then if it does, it becomes a nimbostratus. It is white to light gray in color. They have a very uniform base and they appear to blanket all the sky. Think dreary day, that's stratus. <laughs> And then stratocumulus, they are like long parallel rows. They have broken globular patches. They have a scallop bottom. And nimbostratus produces precipitation. So it's this one, except producing precipitation low visibility. Um, see them a lot along fronts. So here's what they look like. There's some stratocumulus there. Notice they look in the rows there. And then this one, okay, so I have a little fight with the textbook. The textbook says this is a nimbostratus, but I don't see any rain happening. So I call this one a stratus, and then I got you one with a rainbow so you know for a fact that it's raining. So this one I call nimbostratus, this one stratus. Can it be nimbostratus? Absolutely. But I just don't see any rain, so that's why I make the distinction. Okay, so the clouds of vertical development, we start with cumulus cumulus. There are little teeny puffballs. Um, super cute and fluffy, and then it moves to cumulus mediocris. So that's in there. They get a little bit puffier on this on the top side. Then we start building these towers. So when we build the towers, or it looks like a cauliflower, that's a cumulus congestus, like it has a cold, right? It is congested, it's building. And then once it reaches this anvil head state, it is called a cumulonimbus cloud. And you see the word nimbus, you should think rain. 
This is a thunderstorm cloud. So that's what they look like. All right, a couple of weird clouds. So we have lenticular cloud. This is real. Everybody's like, this is Photoshop. It's not Photoshop. It's real. Okay, it's Mount Fuji in Japan. I think that's the most impressive lenticular clouds, but we usually see the ones like this around here, so not as impressive. But um, they are common around rugged or mountainous terrains. So again, the airflow is bumping into the mountains. There's turbulent flow on the other side. It causes these clouds to form. So there's the lenticular clouds there on the leeward side. Um, Unisius, Unisius, these are hook-shaped clouds, precursors to bad weather. And we have fract fractured clouds or fractus clouds. These are either stratus or cumulus clouds that appear to be broken. When these swirl around, they can rotate. Um, people seem to mistake them for tornadoes, so be aware of that. Mematis, these are impressive, right? Again, I took the ones on the right. Not the one on the left, that one's stolen from the internet for educational purposes. <laughs> um, so these are mammatus clouds, they are utter shaped perturbances, some people call them egg, egg carton or egg crate um, shaped clouds. Yeah, that's what they're called on their bottom surfaces. These are associated with stormy weather, you can see storm down here. These were in Rockville, this is in Silver Spring, we don't get them as impressive as the Midwest here in Maryland, but hey, it's pretty good. Okay, and then there's Asperatus undulatus. These are caused by gravity waves. It's a more recent cloud classification that's been added to the cloud atlas. And these are some over the Silver Spring Metro pre-purple line. <laughs> um, I know, they're not that impressive, but if you watch this video on your own time, you'll see it kind of looks like an ocean of air. It's really cool. Um, and that's a time lapse, just to be clear, it's a time lapse. Uh, pyrocumulus, so this was in Chile, and we had a volcano erupting. There's the Milky Way, and it's nighttime with purple lightning, and the volcano is actually making its own weather system. So that's the pyrocumulus right here. And then there's another picture of that fall streak, right? And then there's that. Like, I don't even know what this is. Uh, I think it was a botched attempt at a cloud seeding project, maybe. But if you can't see very clearly, this cloud has holes in it. Like, there's holes in the cloud. Um, no idea. Not sure what happened there. So, do you have a favorite type of cloud? <laughs> Lastly, we will cover fog. So, fog is also a type of cloud. It's just um, very near or at the ground. So there are five different types of fog. Here we go. First one is radiation fog. So this results from radiational cooling on the ground and the air. Um, the high humidity can cause a small amount of cooling to lower the temperature to the dew point. To be extensive, there should be a slight breeze. It's usually thickest in valleys like this one in California. This one has fog almost every day of the year. It's just like always foggy there. And then I love the sign. This is from the textbook. There's a sign that says fog. It's like I'm driving in the fog. How can I see the sign that says fog <laughs> if, it's, if it's foggy? Anyway, I thought it was funny. All right, so first is radiation. So it's radiational cooling from the surface. Now, the other way, number two, is advection fog. This is when I bring in warm, moist air over a cold surface. So there's transporting of moisture. I need wind for this to happen, roughly 6 to 18 miles per hour. And the most famous place this happens is San Francisco. So this is Golden Gate Bridge. There's a person here just for size. It's like really, really small. Um, but all these fluffy clouds are actually advection fog. Ta-da! So radiation fog, advection fog. Number three is upslope fog. This is created when relative humid air moves up some kind of landform or steep slopes of mountains from Hawaii, because why not? Um, but you can also see this kind of fog in Pennsylvania. So when you go through like the windy roads that go up the sides of the mountains, you can see it looks like clouds are stuck in the trees. That's how my dad put it. So stuck in the trees, those are upslope fog. 
And number four is steam fog. So this occurs when cool air moves over warm water and the moisture evaporates and saturates the air above it. It's very common over lakes, so you see one here. It's also the reason for biofog, more on that later. And this is a picture um, with a cameo of the professor's sister there of Yellowstone. So this is the Grand Prismatic Spring, a little bit of ge geology for you here. So this spring is filled with very, very, very hot water and there are creatures that live in it, um, specifically bacteria that like the hot water and they cause these different colors. This is not for swimming, okay? Stay on the path, Professor said so. But these clouds um, are that steam fog and when we walked through and we got all nice and warm and moist and then we walked out and we're like, oh, it's cold. Because when we went there, it was like 58 degrees or something. It was really chilly. Really chilly that day in Yellowstone. Okay, the fifth type of fog is frontal fog or precipitation it occurs when rain falls and evaporates, saturating the air below. Looks kind of like that, right? So it just rained here and then you see this kind of like cloud on the ground. That would be precipitation fog. Or you might see steam in a parking lot kind of coming up. That's also sort of the same thing. Okay, this is where fog forms. Gives you the different types. Um, when I grew up on the Eastern Shore, we actually delayed or canceled class school due to fog. We called it Eastern Shore Martian Death Fog. That is copyrighted. No, it's not. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but like there was a parent or an administrator or something who looked outside and they were like, oh, it's too fog. I mean, this was serious fog, guys. Like it would be um, less than a quarter mile visibility. It was really, 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 really bad fog <laughs> and they would cancel class so i know all about fog the professor knows about fog um but you also notice that these kind of areas right where there are mountains we see some fog happening and let me tell you when you drive through west virginia <laughs> um it was my first time so i'm going through west virginia through the cumberland gap and there's a sign that says fog ahead right and it is a bright sunny day i was just like okay it's a bright sunny day. I don't see any fog. Maybe the sign wasn't updated, right? And you're going along at the speed limit, which is like 70, 80 miles an hour or something like that. It's an interstate. And you're just going along. Da -da -da, and then suddenly whoosh, it's fog. And you can't see anything. Like there was, you know, a sheer drop off to your right or something. And then suddenly there's nothing. You can just see all this cloud. And I freaked out. Because I was not, even though I read the sign, I know. Professor, you read the sign, you should have known. I know. But I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't realize that it was true. So, yeah. And then you come out on the other side, right? So I'm going up into the mountain, right? If we, we call them mountains around here, okay? So we go up into the mountain, fog, and then when you come down the other side, back to the bright sunny day. It was the weirdest thing I've ever experienced. So strange. Um, so yeah, be careful in this area, right? Great Smoky Mountains, also super uh, popular fog area. Advection fog, radiation fog down by the Gulf. A lot of moisture down here, also um, along California coast. So the only place you're kind of safe is maybe in this section of the country, but even there you can get radiation fog. So anyway, have you seen fog in real life? Tell me about it. Okay, and then there's the vocabulary words for this section. And then we do some cloud matching in class. That's also a vocabulary set. It has the picture of the cloud. There are three pictures for each type of cloud so that you can practice with the names. All right. So hopefully you enjoyed this on Moisture and Cloud. See you next time.